you fill me with joy in your presence. What a beautiful verse. You will fill me with joy in your presence. We all want our life to matter. We all want our life to matter. We all want to give our time, we want to give our energy to things that are meaningful. To things that are meaningful. We want that. Today, we are exploring the felt need for meaningful living amidst the rat race of life. Amidst the rat race of life. And Delhi doesn't help. The traffic does not help. The rain definitely does not help. And driving with Delhiites, and that's a whole other story. We're exploring the felt need for meaningful living amidst. You can't change anything, right? You can't change life. You can't change the traffic, you can't change the, the, the schedules, the demands, the, the work expectations, the projects, the targets. But how can we inject meaning, meaningful living? One, one clarity, one clarification is, I am not talking about the meaning of life this morning. This morning we're not saying, is our life, does our life have meaning? You can go to the book of Ecclesiastes for that. I'm talking about meaningful living, you and me, every day, Friday, Wednesday, Sunday. Meaningful living, where my relationship is a meaningful one. If it's not meaningful, dump it. This engagement was a meaningful, this was a meaningful conversation. A meaningful trip, I made a meaningful trip. This vacation was a mean, I, I'm talking about you come back full. You come back full, you come back full. So that's what I'm talking about this morning. I don't know why it, it hit me. A couple of weeks ago, I'm like, we need to talk about this. Because we so, our schedules are full, but our days are empty. Our schedules are full, but our days are empty. And for eternity to matter, today must matter, right? If today doesn't matter, then it's easy to talk big about eternity. And something tells me that we were meant to be spent. We were meant to be poured out. We were meant to be spent. We were not meant to hoard, to keep. Something tells me that that's where the answer is. That's where we need to look at. We were meant to be spent. So we want our day to end, whether it's Wednesday, whether it's Saturday, whether it's Sunday. We want our day to end with a sense that it was meaningfully spent. Go to bed, lie on, the, lie on bed, look at the ceiling and it's like, that was a good day. That was a good day. I don't know when the last time you had that feeling or you had that sense, right? We want that. Meaningfully spent. I'm using the word spent over and over again. We need to be spent, poured out, invested, given away, spread thin. Not live in vain, not leave us drained. Not live in vain, not leave us drained. Not live in vain. What does that even mean? What does living in vain mean? Are we at any risk of doing that? This past week, this past year, has anything I've been doing, any life, any relationship, been in vain? Nobody likes to think so, but... Let me survey some scriptures and then let's talk you and me, okay? Okay. God's will for us is this. This is, this is what God wants. Jesus said the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The, Jesus said the thief comes to kill, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come, I'm not a thief. I have come that, do, that they may have life and have it to the full. You know this verse. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Life full. God wants you to have a full life. God wants you to have a full life, not full of things, that your life itself is full. That you're filled constantly, never running on empty, never running on a sense of I need this in order to feel better, feel more, etc., etc. So what is God's will? What does God want? This is what he wants. Jesus himself said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
Here's our theme verse for today. I want us to just meditate on this. And if you can, if you can work through it, that would be great. You make known to me the path of life. Underline path of life. You make known to me the path of life. You will, underline, fill me. You will fill me with joy. Where? In your presence. With eternal pleasures. That means pleasures that last for eternity. They don't run out. They don't finish up. They don't wear out. But pleasures eternal at your right hand. So here, you make known to me the path of life. In this life, you fill me with joy in your presence. I've got you here and then in eternity I've got pleasures at your right hand evermore. Psalm 16 verse 11. Meaningfulness. Meaningfulness. That answers the question, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? What, in your relationship, in your work, when you get to work, what are you actually looking for? Don't, don't say money. Don't say money. Money though, we all need money. But that's not what you're looking for. Because there are people with 10 rupees and there are people with 10 million and both are look, still looking for the same thing. Meaningfulness. Then there's materialistic. What are we selling ourselves for? What are we selling ourselves for? Or there's the moment. There's the momentous. Who are we living for? What moment are we living for? What success event are we living for? And you work all your life toward that and then you work the rest of your life as an ex that. You get what I'm saying? All your life you work toward that moment and the rest of your life, I'm an ex so and so. I'm an ex so and so. People in their 20s, people in their 30s, mostly living for that high. And why high? I don't mean drugs. I mean accomplishment. I mean the next win, the next deal closed, the next promotion, the next raise. The next dopamine fix, the next... I mean, we're just scrolling life, basically, aren't we? We're scrolling life. Day to day, as you look at the past seven days, we just scrolled life. Because I can't remember what happened at three o'clock that day. I don't know why I went there. I don't know what I did. I don't know how I passed my time. What is robbing me of meaning? What are the distractions from a meaningful life? I mean, this could be a meaningful life, but I'm distracted. So I want to ask the question, is success, the pursuit of success, a distraction from a meaningful life or is it the way to a meaningful life? Is success itself the meaning of life or, or is... Because why would you want more if you just got it? And if you just got it, why would you compare it to somebody else if it was satisfactory? Success is elusive. Success is deceptive. Success is only by your definition. Success is in the moment. What is robbing me of meaning? And I search my life, I search my, my, my relationships and my time, my life on. And I find myself, uh, find myself speaking shallow conversations. My conversations don't go any deeper because I'm too afraid to offend, too afraid to get deep, too afraid to intervene, too afraid to, you know, to get too deep into your life. My, my, my friendships, uh, my conversations are shallow. My friends are shallow. Today in the Facebook age, with every passing generation, their friends are shallow. Do you remember those days when we just sat and we had that one friend? And we do everything with that one friend. Girls, you're normally three. Because you need to cope. And the guy, we just... I can't remember the time we didn't talk. You know, either we beat each other, or we, were, we had fun, or we yelled at each other, but we... That was my best friend. And the best friend lasted, what, 20 years? 20, 30, 40 years? I can still go back and I'll say, from my 20s, that was my best friend. From my 10s, that was my best friend. When I was five, Alfred was my best friend. You know, I had one solid friend. Today, the young people today, day and age, not judging, I'm just saying, life, there's no deep friendships. There's no deep conversations. Conversations that go past the gunk. You know what I'm talking about? Conversations that go past the gunk. You know, when you get to a point where you now need to work through that irritability. In marriage, they call it the seven-year itch, but in, I'm just talking friendships and conversations. When you hit that first disagreement, oh, oh, you don't see it the way I see it? You're saying black, I'm saying white, I'm saying blue, you're saying green. Okay, we work through that. It's okay. 
Everything's going to be fine. Don't unfriend. In our day, we didn't have the choice to unfriend. <laughs> And his mother and my mother will get together and say, you, you kiss and make up. We didn't have that choice. We had to work through it. But today's day and age allows you to shut the door, sign out, unfriend, cut off, cut off, cut off, cut off, and soon you are all alone. Psychologically, emotionally, you are isolated, and you have not worked through any shallow, shallow friendships, shallow Conversation. Let's talk about shallow, short-term loyalties. In the career today, if you are still in the same place for 15, 20 years, it's looked down on. But 50 years ago, 30 years ago, if you said, I've been with this company for 40 years, I got a gold watch, people are going to applaud you. Wow, you stuck around. You stuck around. 2003, when I was handwriting the Purpose Driven Life book, uh, Purpose Driven Church book, and I was preparing my heart for a ministry, a long, a long, long haul ministry, the very first line in that book in the Purpose Driven Church, uh, Rick Warren says, if you're not in it for the long haul, don't bother. Don't bother. So when I came back, I was, this was in Kazakhstan, when I came back, I said, I'm going to go back to Delhi, and I'm going to settle there and I'm going to pour into one church and I'm going to be in one area, preferably one pin code, and pour my life out. Right there, for long term. Okay? I did that. Today, 31 years have passed. And I asked myself, is it worth it? Yes, of course it's worth it. But it doesn't feel like it sometimes. Sometimes you feel like you wasted. So every next generation is saying, quit, move, new opportunity, new opportunity. As soon as things get difficult, move on. As soon as things get tight, move on. The moment you hit a difficult time in your, in your work, some, there's always one creep in your team, right? There's always one character in your team that, is, that has an issue or is just, I don't know, from the devil. So you've got to work with that and the whole team's falling apart. The whole work is falling apart. Every day you've got to wake up to think, oh, I have to go and face that person. Don't look at them right now, but you have to face that. But oh, it's just so, and it kills your work. It kills your work joy. It kills your 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 rhythm. It kills your your sense, the desire to go back to work. Any good relationships you could have had with other people are destroyed, all because you are now fixated on one this one person. We don't work through that. We don't know what to do with that. And these are the things that destroy meaning in our life. It destroys meaningful living in our life. There's short conversations, there's shallow friends, there's, there's uh, short-term loyalties. So I quit. I quit. My, wife, my, my boss doesn't realize my value. My boss doesn't realize my value. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Because the other school, the other work, the other co company, they, they know my value. No, they don't. No, they don't. You're just selling yourself for a higher price. I mean, you keep moving, you keep selling yourself and selling yourself and selling yourself until the end of the day, you're just a slave, really. A meaningful life isn't what comes to you, but what comes from you. A meaningful life isn't what comes to you, it's what comes from you. If your whole goal in life is to be blessed, you'll never really get there. But if your life is to be a blessing, Make me a blessing to someone today. Perhaps you're on the right path. Perhaps you're moving in the right direction. When your life is spread thin for others, given away, burnt up, offered up, there in lies. I mean, every great man, every great woman that has ever lived, any name that you have studied, that you have testified, or any name that you have recognized through history of people who have given themselves uh, sacrifice themselves, they are the ones you call great. They are the ones you call great. Something greater, something greater than yourself. The need to be self-preserving, need to be self-burning and, and do, live life for me, live life, that's not panning out. It's, it's, it's not panning out. It's not the way to a meaningful life. The secret of a meaningful life is hidden in the answer to the question, who will be the center of my life? Who will, be the, who will get the glory of my life? Who will get the glory of my life? So if you're going to live a meaningful hour, 
If you're going to live a meaningful day, if you're going to live a meaningful life, you have, you will have to look beyond yourself. The world will say, look within, look within. Everything you need to be great is right there within. No, it's not. You were made for a relationship. You were made to be connected to life, not the author of life. You were not the author of life. You were made to be connected to life. Your, your meaning, your purpose, your fulfillment was to be found in the relationship with the author of life, with the source of life. And as long as you're disconnected, you can keep trying to start a fire, start a fire, start a fire, but you're never going to get the flame. Not within, not around, but beyond yourself. Let's look at scripture real quick and then come back to us. Meaningful living comes from, number one, a purpose greater than you. Meaningful living comes from a purpose greater than you, something bigger than you. First and foremost, if you're going to live a meaningful life, it has to stop being about you. Everything, for God's sake, about you. Every conversation, every emotion, every offense, every, everything that goes right or goes wrong, it's all about you. Mm. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16 through 20, big passage, but we'll zone in on a couple of verses. I do not cease to give thanks for you. Paul is talking to the Ephesian church and he says, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, may give you the spirit of wisdom, capital S, the spirit of wisdom. Firstly, that God would give you, my prayer is that God would give you the spirit of wisdom. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. And two, of revelation, of revelation, because the meaningfulness of life, the ability to live a meaningful life, the ability to have a meaningful conversation, the ability to make meaningful choices or meaningful direct, choose meaningful directions, does not come from research, it does not come from discovery, it doesn't come from books you read, it comes from revelation. God reveals that to you because nobody has lived your life. Ever. And nobody will live your life again. Your life, what you look like, your circumstances, your background, things, the way things worked out for your parents, for you, for your children, the way you are, all the instance, incidences and, and things that brought you to who you are today. Nobody has lived your life. Nobody's life is that cookie cutter, same as copy paste to anybody else. You are you. You are unique and God wants to reveal, not research, not resource, but reveal to you how your life could be meaningful. So he says, I pray that you would have the number one spirit of wisdom, number two, revelation of the knowledge of him. Having eyes of your heart, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. Don't miss this. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. That means you've got these eyes. Fat lot of good that's done us. Right? And then you've got the eyes of your heart. Now, you ought to check that eyesight, right? The eyes of your heart may be enlightened that you may know, not feel, not, not experience, but know what is the hope to which you have been called, underline called, underline called, the hope to which you have been called. What are we answering? You need a purpose greater than yourself. You need a purpose that, you need, your life needs to be something bigger than what you are, who you are to which you are called. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his underlying power? His power toward us who believe. His power. So there is a power source for believers. There's a power source for believers. For unbelievers, those who want to live without God, Jesus, the, they, they have only themselves. They have their own inspiration. They have their aspiration. They have their perspiration in terms of hard work. They have only their own resources. But believers say, God, you created me to do life with you. Resource must come from you. Wisdom must come from you. Direction must come from you. Revelation must come from you. And you plug in to his calling, to his inheritance, and to his immeasurable great power. Look at the words used here. Immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great mind that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Boy, I wish I could camp on that verse, but let's move on. The first thing, if you want to live a meaningful life, number one is what? What is it? A purpose greater than yourself. Something bigger than you. You are not the reason for your life. And half the reasons you're so frustrated is because you are the, constantly the center of your world. Two, a power greater than yours. 
That's what helps with a meaningful life. You live with a power greater than yours. I just explained it, but let me give you another verse. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. For it is God, for it is God, and remember those of you coming from any background, religious faith, otherwise, God is a person. He made you like himself. You are a person. He has attributes he hasn't shared with you, but a lot of attributes he has shared with you. So to know God is possible. To be in a relationship with God is possible. He's a person. And as a person, he says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work. For it, God, it is God who works in you because he wants to and because he will do. Because he wants to and he will do. For, who, for what? For his good pleasure. A power greater than yours. You want to live a meaningful life? You need to plug into a source, plug into a fuel, plug into a power that's bigger than you. If you want to accomplish something bigger than you in your life, you need to plug into a resource that's bigger than you. Number three, a vision greater than your own. A vision greater than your own. What is the vision of your life? Oh, engineer one now, man. Engineer, engineer one now. Engineer one now. Bano, yaar. Engineer bano. But you will retire at 65. And then what will you be? Then you will be ex-engineer. So 20 years you will, you will be pre-engineer. 30 years you are engineer. And 25 years you are ex-engineer. Come on! That can't be the definition of success, Okay. That's one fun uh, perspective. Look at the different varied ways people have a dream for your life. Your mother has a dream for your life. Your grandmother has a dream for your life. Your uncle who sees potential in you has a dream for your life. Your teachers have a dream for your life. Your best friend has a dream for your life. Your wife has two dreams for your life. Every, everybody has got a dream for your life. Hmm, lovely. But you need a vision, a dream greater than your own. Remember the word calling. Remember the word calling. Then you don't stop with career. You move into consecration. You are sold out for something greater. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things. What things? Meaningful words, meaningful relationships, meaningful vacations, meaningful career, meaningful uh, relationships. Everything that you're looking for, which would give you a sense, fill you with a sense of value, fun, joy, it will be added to you. It will be added to you. It is not the main thing. It is the addition. It is not the key thing. It is the addition. A vision greater than yourself. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. By the way, 33 years in ministry, I don't think we understand what the kingdom of God is. I don't think we get it. I don't think I get it. Clearly, I got some glimpses of it. I don't think we get it. I think we have um, romanticized views of the kingdom of God. I think we have some definitions of it, but I don't think we get it. We think some one of us think it's heaven. Some of us think it's God's governance general. Some of us think that, that, that it, is a, it is a citizenship. Some of us think that it is a way of living. Uh, Matthew 5, Matthew 6. Uh, you know, we, we have all these definitions, but every sermon I preach, every time you come to church, it should be about kingdom living. It should be about how to live in the kingdom of God. And Jesus says the kingdom of God is among you. What does that mean? The kingdom of God is in you. What does that mean? We have to understand this if we are going to live in the kingdom. And the kingdom is much bigger, much bigger than you. And it's a great, great vision to have for your life. Four, a life spent and consumed. A meaningful way to live. Meaningful living comes from a purpose greater than you a power greater than yours, a vision greater than your own, a life spent and consumed. You want to pour your life out. Philippians 1, verse 21 to 25. For to me, to live is period. That is the Christian disciple's life focus. Nothing more, nothing less. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Paul what do you mean, Paul? What do you mean? He explains in 22 to 25. If I am to live in the flesh, if I am to continue living in this case, not die, live, that means fruitful labor for me, fruitful labor for me. Yet, which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. I'm stretched between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ because the spiritual me, the eternal me saying, I want to be in heaven. I want to be home. 
Home is calling me. That's why we say when believers die, we say they're homecoming. Believers are call, God is calling me. The scripture says, the, the, in the uh, precious of the sight of God, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There is great hope in the believer's death because life begins. This is boot camp. This is orientation. This is the corridor. You enter into his cathedral as you close your eyes here on earth. It's a beautiful existence. So Paul says, oh, I want to be with him. I just, everything wants, I want to chuck this flesh and its hunger and its brokenness and its sensuality and its, and its sinfulness. And I want to be with him because I've loved him all my life. Great, Paul. So that's what he wants from his life. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. For that is far better. Do you have it? For that is far better. Verse 24. But. Ay, ay, ay. But. To remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Sounds very cocky, doesn't it? I want to go, but if I'm staying, I'm staying for you. That sounds very cocky. Everybody will be like, please, just, just go. Go to heaven. But look at what Paul is saying is, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue. Remain and continue with all of, for your progress and joy in the faith. With you all for your progress. So if I'm going to die, great, I get to be with Jesus. If I'm going to live, okay, fine, I'm going to serve. If I'm dying, I'm going to be with Jesus. If I live, I'm going to serve. With every ounce of my being, with every day of my life. This life is, is not, I'm trying to make something of this life. This is 70 years. What, 70 years? For us, for so many of us, it's 24 left. What's left? I mean, I'm not going to waste my life. I want to be there. Lord, can I come home? Okay, fine. Then you have to help me. Okay. You have to give me strength. Okay. You have to give me, you know, you heard what she said. You heard what she said. Who, who's, who's supposed to live with that? You get where I'm going with this? So every day becomes about, Lord, give me, live it out. Live it out. Live for this person. Live for that person. Invest. Improve. Introspect. Invest. Improve. Introspect. Invest. Improve. Introspect. This life is not what God has created you for. He's created you for eternity with him. But you have this life. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So if I'm here, I'm going to be like Christ. If I'm there, I'm going to be with Christ. If I'm here, I'm going to be like Christ. If I'm there, love Jesus, love like Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 verse 17. But for even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. Underline sacrifice, underline service. Coming from your faith. I am glad. Underline I am glad. Why? And I rejoice. Why? With all of you. Your relation, your life has to become about relationships. About being poured out. About being spent. Success has to be seeing others rise. Because a rising tide raises all the boats. And when you succeed, people around you should succeed. If you have to succeed at the cost of everybody else failing, if you have to win for somebody else, to, somebody else has to lose for you to win, if somebody else has to go down for you to go up, that is not success. Not in God's economy, it isn't. That is not success. That is not success. To be spent, to be given out, to be great, not to be needed or wanted, but to volunteer your life, your time, your energy. I'm not talking about social work. Don't go down that road. I'm talking about your hard work, your labor, but done in a way that you could lift your community up, your government up, your, your, your nation up, your team up, your family up. You live for someone else other than yourself. That's the first start. It's the head in the right direction toward a meaningful life. You empty yourself, God fills you. You empty yourself, God fills you. You empty yourself, God fills you. God wants you to be that. He wants you to be that life that he can put on display. He can put on display, say, see what I can do with a life that's completely given to me. A life that's completely given to me. While we were studying preaching, you know, and we were talking about how do you gain an audience and how do you, and, and one of the great writers wrote, he says, get on fire for God and people will come to watch you burn. Get on fire for God and people come to watch you burn. There is no fire without something burning up. 
Something has to be consumed. Something has to be a fuel. And you say to God, God, I'm the fuel. I'm the fuel. Let me be the fire of transformation in people's lives. Let me be the fire that brings heat and warmth to somebody. Let me be that. I don't want to live for myself. Lastly, a life in step with the author of life. A meaningful life is spent by a life in step with the author of life. If he is the author, if I was made to live in tandem with him, in step with him, plugged into him, Galatians 5.25 says, if we live by the Spirit, that means if the Spirit of God has brought us to life, if it is the one that has given us life, let us also then continue in the Spirit. Let us continue in step with the Spirit. What kind of steps are we talking about? The Spirit of God prompts you. When you give your life to Jesus, when you come to Christ and acknowledge him for who he is, accept him for who he is, and you give him free reign in your life, he forgives your sin, he tears up your charge sheet, he remembers your sin no more, and he advocates for you in heaven, number one. Number two, he gives you his spirit as a down payment or as a, uh, as a guarantee. He gives you a spirit, and his spirit lives in you and works in you to lead you and guide you during your life here until you get to there. So far with me? Okay. He says, if you have been given life there by the spirit, you need to be in step with him here also in the spirit because this spirit will prompt you. He will guide you. He will lead you. He will hold you back from saying stuff, from doing stuff, from going somewhere. He warns, he nudges, he gives discernment. He convicts, he fills with assurance of peace right in the heart of turmoil. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life as we speak. So your primary relationship in a life of meaning is with the Spirit of God. It is with the Spirit of God. Without a relationship, an ongoing, functional, dynamic, working relationship with the Holy Spirit, you cannot live the meaningful life that God has planned for you. And if you're going to live with the Spirit, you have to be spiritually alive. Don't, don't concoct it. He has to bring you to life and connect you. He has to... He has to make that connection with you. And he does that when you call out for mercy. You want to live a meaningful life. You want your relationships, your marriage, your, marriage, your, your working uh, relationships to be meaningful. You want the years that you spend. You remember how fast the last five years have gone? How many of you have said in the last one month, how many of you said, I'm growing old fast? Don't raise your hands. I mean, every time you pass a mirror, you're like, whoa. We're growing old fast. The 20s are like history lesson. It's like, Jalyan Walabag. It's like, it's like far away. Last five years, I can tell you what happened. Ask me before that, it's just a blur. That fast, your life is hurtling towards the end. And somewhere now in the fourth chapter of your life, you're asking the question, what is it like to live a meaningful life? It's got to be bigger than you. It's got to be greater than you. It's be, and all that's going to come from God in, your, in, in the context of relationship with God. So three words I want you to remember. Number one is invest. Invest. If I'm going to live a meaningful life, I need to invest in people. Stocks and bonds, go for it. Businesses, land, apartments, please, by all means, go for it. But when you invest in people, you take your investment with you. You'll take your investment with you when you invest in people. People are God's greatest asset. I don't mean people in your company. You know, when, when management gurus say people are our greatest asset. They mean that in a commodity sense. But for you, they are the living, breathing opportunity that God gives for, to give your, meaning, give your life meaning. Why do you want children? Because you want to pour yourself out into somebody else. Why do you find joy in children? Because you see yourself in someone else. You see yourself in your son. Look, he's behaving like you. Look, he's got your nose. You, you get great joy when you see your trainees or when you see your... It's students learning from you. When you're poured out, when it comes through you to somebody else, it fills you with meaning. That's the meaning of life. That's what it means to have a meaningful life. So when you invest, invest in people, invest in relationships, invest in conversations. Let the conversation go through a hard time. It's okay. If you go into an argument and they're not agreeing with you, stay. 
Don't walk away. Don't slam the door. Because your ego can't take what's coming your way. You're not able to listen through to the end of the conversation. You can't shut up yourself. You can't listen to... You, you're not willing to work through the gunk of the conversation. You're not willing to work through the process of, of that experience in your workplace where it's hard now. It's not going to be hard forever. It's not going to be hard forever. Ask somebody who's been in a company for 30 years. Where, where there are hard times? Of course there were hard times. Were there conflicts in relationships? Of course there were. Were there times where you felt like a failure, you wanted to quit? Absolutely. Pastors, every Monday morning. Previous Sunday was 123 people. Last Sunday, 93 people. 30 people missing, all sick, genuinely. This Sunday, I'm about to find out. Every Monday morning, we can all go through that and say, but you've got to stick to it because that's the meaningfulness. That's, the, that's where it comes. When you stand here, you say, I'm right here. 110001. Hit me. I'm standing right here. No one can take me out unless God takes me out. That stickability, that elasticity is what God gives and makes life meaning. You jump, you walk away from every relationship, every argument, anything, it gets uncomfortable. You walk away, walk away, cut off, cut off, walk away. Finally, you're an island, you're alone, you have no friends, and finally you're in your 50s or your 60s, and you say, there are no deep friends anymore, no deep friends. I'm talking about me only, I'm not even talking about you guys. I, all, all my life, I cannot handle those, com those conflicts, I don't want to work through. Work through the gunk of the conversation. Work through the process of hard work. Don't leave your job when things are bad. Never leave your job when things are bad. Stick around, work it out, make sure everything's great, and when you're on top of things, and everybody loves you again, then leave. At least you'll get a gold watch. But when everybody leaves, there's unprocessed grief, unprocessed problems, unprocessed conversations. You know, you haven't finished. You just left. You left the relationship. You left the job. You left the company. You left the project. It wasn't going well. I didn't like where I was. I walked away. I walked. There are times when you need to walk away. There are times you need to bow out. But for the most part, invest. Number two, improve someone's life. When a servant comes into your home <clears throat> and they've been working, you for, working with you for five years, Manlo, does it change anything? Does it change anything? Have, has their life changed at all? Somebody married you. They've been married to you for 26 years. 26 years. Me, my wife, Sumit Mixi, Futura, Kuka. We celebrated 26 years. <laughs> Is my wife any better off today having invested 26 years of her life with me? Is your husband any better today? You get where I'm going with this? Are the lives of people around you improving or getting worse? Improve people around you. Don't just give to beggars. Don't just give to get beggars. Give jobs. Give transformational, sustainable change. Work to make sustainable change for people around you. God will back you up. Third, introspect. Introspect. This has to do with having margins in your life. This has to do with having margins in your life. People say, my, my life is stuck in a rut. You know what a rut is? A rut is a grave with the ends knocked out. It's just, you're... You know those spinning wheels with the rat in it? What do they call that? Hamster wheels? You just, you just... And you get tired, you stop, and then you start running again. And it's just meaningless. And you don't have time to grieve. You don't have time to process. You don't have time to think. When someone dies in your family, when, some, when there's a tragedy, an earthquake, when there's a major loss, everybody says, like, oh, okay. Okay, there's been a tragedy, there's been a trauma. Give them time to grieve. But you know what was worse than one big tragedy in your life? A thousand little, little everyday disappointments that pile up over the years. And you don't give yourself enough time to stop and say what that person said or how that turned out, the way I had to leave, the way I was thrown out, it hurt like hell. And I'm going to sit and not whinge and cry about it, not lick my 
my source, but I'm going to process it. Yep, that did happen to me. Was it right? No, but it did happen to me. Well, life sucks. Life sucks. Life happens. To everybody it happens. It didn't happen only to me. Only to me this happened. No. No. It happens. It happens. Bad things happen to good people. And everybody thinks they're good. <laughs> Everyone. Are you with me so far? Process it. You don't have time. You fill your lives with activities so that you don't have to think. You fill your brain with noise so that you don't have to think. And that is led to a meaningless life. Not thinking, not stopping to think. Those olden days, 1,000 years ago, 15, 500 years ago, people lived quiet lives. They walked for hours. They spent hours on the side of the, uh, the, the, the rivers or the, or the streams or the mountains. And they enjoyed, they soaked in life. And you say, what? Meaningless life. We are accomplishing much more. Our schedules are full. Our days are empty. Our schedules are full. Our days are empty. Activity will never amount to meaning in your life. You don't have time to breathe. You don't have time to enjoy people, things. Even the money you've earned. You don't have time to grieve small things, big things. You don't have time to rest. You don't have time to recharge. You're just a hamster on a wheel. Lord, I want to be used by you. Not just that I want to have a meaningful life. Not just that I want to have meaningful relationships, days, hours, conversations, directions. I, I want my life to be filled with meaning. I want to go to sleep thinking that was a good day. That was a good week. I, I spent it well. And not just that. But Lord, I want to be used by you. In the, in the process of being spent, I want to be spent for you. Not by my company. Not by my, my manipulative relatives. Not by the world. Not by the, the commercial world. Not by the food industry. I, wa I want to be spent by you. I want you to take my life. And I want you to pour my life out in a direction you might choose. I want to be burnt up for you, Lord. I want to be found in step with you, Lord. I want to be known for your life in me. Man, you've seen Jesus in that guy. Oh, he's dead to himself and he's all alive to Christ. I want every conversation, every handshake, every relationship, every hour I spend, every word I say to be an investment. Every time I walk away, people must feel blessed, man. People must feel, feel fuller, feel better, feel raised, feel hopeful. I want to make a difference in people's lives. I don't want just the one thing about my life or week to be a check at the end of it. I want to be more than that. And I can't do this on my own, Lord. I can't do this on my own. You have to work in me and you have to work through me. It has to be your life because yours is the only meaningful life. I want my happiness to come from my holiness. I want my happiness to come from my holiness. Let's close with this verse. Walk away, leave church this morning with this verse in your mind. Would you read it with me? Psalm 37 verse 23 and 24. When people's steps follow the Lord, God is pleased with their ways. If they stumble, they will not fall because the Lord holds their hand. Let's do that again. When people's steps follow the Lord, God is pleased with their ways, their manner of life. If they stumble, even if they stumble, they're not going to fall flat on their face because God holds their hands. Bow your heads and finish your business with God. This is not a motivational speech. This is not a motivational speech. This is not a nice talk. This is you and God. I was just the postman. Hi, I'm Jeremy Dawson, and if you liked what you just saw, if it was a blessing, then hit the subscribe button. Come on, you can do it. Hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the bell so that we know you want to hear from us. Lots of videos coming your way, songs, worship, encouragement. Come on, subscribe. Let's take this forward and share with somebody you might know. Write a comment in the section below, but let's see you guys again. Come on, subscribe. <laughs>